But we were talking last week, we talked last week in great deal in 1 Samuel chapter number 15. Remember uh, uh, the Amalekites, God had been gracious to them uh, and, and uh, asked uh, and because they had come against the children of Israel in their weakness. And, uh, and, and so uh, God is merciful to the Amalekites and gives them 500 cures that they could make things right with, with him. But they did not. And uh, so the Lord stuck by his word and he said that he was going to utterly destroy the Amalekites and he wanted uh, the new king, uh, Saul, to follow up the orders and destroy everything. That was the word that, that he was to destroy. God made him to be king. God, God allowed him to be king. And uh, uh, he looked really, really good. But immediately uh, he fell from what doing what God had asked him to do. You know, when we come into a relationship with God, our highest form of worship can be doing what He asked us to do. And uh, sometimes we may make it, want to make it more complicated and do something different. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But here it was that uh, God told him to destroy. And we read that uh, Saul and the people chose that they were going to take Agai, Ag the king of the Amalekites, and keep him. They were going to keep the best of the oxen and of the sheep, and uh, they were going to sacrifice. God told them to destroy everything. And I know that seems kind of hard to us to imagine, destroying babies and children, but this is what God required. This is the Old Testament. God wanted to, to, to uh, rid of, of, of the flesh, and uh, even the things that seemed young, even the things that seemed good. Remember we talked uh, last week that uh, Amalek is a type of the flesh. God wants us, when we get saved, to uh, destroy the flesh. There's nothing good in us. If there's anything good in us, it's of God. And so we don't say, well, God, I'm going to keep this part. I'm going to surrender the rest to you. But God wants total surrender. He makes us a new creation. All things are passed away. All things, all things are become new. And so the Bible says that the word of the Lord came to Samuel that Saul didn't do what God had commanded him to do. What did Samuel do that night? Did he sleep like a baby? He didn't pray. He was disturbed by the he like he prayed. Because he seen the condition of, 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 of the king. He saw the condition of God's people not doing what, what God had asked them to do. Can I ask us a question? I'm not asking you to clean up someone else's life. We need to clean up our own life. But we need to get serious about the church and where they are at. It should disturb us that it drives us to a place of prayer that we lose sleep over, over God. We need to see you move and work in your people and in the church. That's what Samuel did. And, and so he came to Saul and he said, Saul's message changed. He said, well, the people, he doesn't include himself in it any longer. Uh, we, we, we did it. And, and Saul said, uh, uh, Samuel said, Saul, what is that, that, that bleeding of sheep and lulling of oxen that I hear? What is that? And he said, oh, we were keeping the very best sacrifice. Uh, uh, we, we want to give it to the Lord. And uh, the, the Lord, he, he, uh, Samuel said, the Lord sent you on a journey and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners and the Amalekites and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore, then you did not obey the voice of the Lord, but did fly upon the spoil and did evil in the sight of the Lord. When God asks us to live holy, God doesn't just want us to raise our hands and mumble a few words that's just full of, 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 of a lot of liturgy or full of a lot of form and routine. God really wants worship from our life. Everything about our life should give worship to God, even when it's sacrificial. Even when it's sacrificial. 
And so Samuel said, I have obeyed the Lord, but 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 and, 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 and have gone the way of the Lord, and, and he brought Agai, the king of the Amalek, uh, and, and not only destroyed the Amalekites, and the people took the spoil of the sheep and the oxen, and the chief things which should have already been destroyed and sacrificed them to the Lord. His story changes. He said it was once me and the people, now he said it was the people. But it doesn't matter, he is leading the people. On Sunday night I said to you that we are mirrors of the mercies of God. We need to be mirroring to others what sacrificial worship is and the giving of our lives and the giving of ourselves to God. Not because we think that we have to live a particular way or we, 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 we come up with some guideline. The law in itself is death. It can't help us. But I said to you last week that when we serve God in the beauty of holiness, He said, be ye holy as I am holy. God is a holy God. He wants a holy people. And how are we holy? And how do we give Him a sacrifice of holiness? Well, holiness is this. It means a relationship with God. When we fall in love with God, that we uh, want to know His Word, that we want instructions from His Word, that when we want to know how God wants us to handle and conduct ourselves in every area of our life, we live holy and we live a holy lifestyle. And it's not because we want to be an oddity. Uh, the world thinks that, oh, there's a little bit of a morality, a source of morality. It's not just about living by a moral compass alone. It's about being in a relationship with God. God. Amen. Live in holy as He is holy. Amen. And that's sacrificial worship. Amen. That's really the sacrifice. And so, uh, we, you're familiar, uh, uh, Samuel says to Saul, uh, 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 the Lord hath great delight in burnt offers and sacrifice uh, as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice to hearken than the fat of rams. He said, listen, you need to trust in God and the relationship with God that He will take care of you. That you don't need to keep the best. That God will give you the best. What are the things in our life that we hold on to? That we really don't want to surrender to God because they're really good things of life. But if God's voice has spoke to us to surrender, then we need to be willing to surrender. Let me look at this for a few moments tonight. There's a wonderful man in the Bible who we know that if I said there was a man, there's a story about him with a great fish, what would that man's name be? What is it? Jonah. Good. One out of all of us, right? No, you all knew you were all the Oh, he whispered to you? Yeah, okay. All right. So, uh, Jonah. God tells Jonah, hey Jonah, I don't want you to go down to Nineveh. Now let's just stop here. You know what? You know what Jonah had a problem with? Jonah had some prejudice. Oh, they're terrible people, murderers. I, I, I can't go there! God, no. What are the things that maybe we have prejudice against in our heart? Uh, maybe it's people. Maybe it's just things that we're prejudiced in. Maybe our pride gets in the way and God says, I want you to rid this or I want you to do this or that. Oh no, God, I can't do that. So you know what we do? We become Jonah. And when God says, go to Nineveh, that's 200 or 700 miles away, we say, God, no, 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 no. I'll sacrifice. I'll go to Nineveh. It's 2,000 miles away. It's got to be better. It's a further journey. Did God want Jonah to sacrifice? God wasn't looking for Jonah to come up with the solution of what he was going to do. God had already given Jonah commanding orders and he was to march. And he thinks, I'll be the bee's knees and I'll just go do what I want to do and I'll, I'll, I'll give a, a greater sacrifice. But God wasn't looking for that. How often in our life do we try to, uh, do we try to bargain with God? Do we try to... Uh, come up with a deal with God, make a deal with God. God, I don't want to do that because I have some prejudice or I have some areas that I don't want to surrender, but I'll go even farther in this area. You see, it's really not real worship. Real worship to God would have been if Jonah would have said, yes, God, I will go to Nineveh. Even though Tarshish, the people of Tarshish, that looks like a better group of people to preach to, and it looks like that would be farther away. You have to ask me to do that. What are the things that God has asked us to do? 
You know, God's called all of us to be holy. Every one of us to be holy. Are we living holy? The areas of our lives that He deals with, how we surrender, it's because if we haven't, we're not really giving sacrificial worship. When you look at the Old Testament, Jesus talked to the woman at the well, and He said, you know, worship's about to change. You know, it's, it, you know, those who worship me now are going to worship in spirit and truth. He was shifting gears. He was changing uh, how worship was going to be. In the Old Testament, they, they had to bring a sacrifice, depending on who they were, their income. And you know, that sacrifice of that lamb that they brought, it wasn't just a lamb that they randomly went out and had a thousand sheep and they didn't care. No, it was one they brought in and they watched and they became very close to. They had endearment to that. And so they loved that lamb. But God required that blood sacrifice, so they gave it to God sacrificially. God is looking for us to worship Him in spirit and in truth. God is looking for the things that are nearest and dearest to our heart. If He says, I want you to surrender, He may not ask you to surrender everything, but we need to be willing to surrender it all. Was it Corey Tim Boone who said that she learned to hold the things of this world loosely so it wouldn't hurt when God pried them from her hand? You see, we need to be willing to give God every area of our life. Every area. And use it as sacrificial worship to Him. You see, when we say sacrificial worship, some people are afraid to get committed to God. That's why you don't see some folks being faithful to church at all. You talk to lots of people and they say, oh, I believe in God. Well, number one, the devils believe. It's about having a relationship with God. And some folks will say, well, I have a relationship with God in nature. I just don't do church. You know, you know what they're saying? They're saying this, I don't want to sacrifice my time. That's what I hear. You know what? That's what God hears. I, I, they want to be out in nature doing their thing and, and they, they love it. They enjoy it. They want to be out there. They don't want to give to themselves. What happens when people don't want to give in sacrificial worship? Well, there's no expectation when they worship. If they don't sacrifice, there's no expectation. But you know when we sacrificially worship God, there's an expectation that God is going to work and move and God is going to take our sacrifice and He's going to be well pleased with it. You see, God wanted obedience from the very beginning, he told Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he said, I don't want you to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do you know what it was set there for? It was set there for obedience. And as long as they didn't eat of it, it was worship unto God. They were honoring God. And by not doing, of that, by not partaking of it, because they were doing what God asked of them. They had all the other trees to eat of. God commanded this. And we find out what happens when there's disobedience. All of a sudden, sin and death enters in. Do you know what happens in our life when there's not obedience to God and worship? It is a doorway for sin to happen in our life. And it's a doorway of death. Do you want to live tonight? I want to live. It's our choice. It boils down to being a choice tonight. Will we choose to sacrificially worship God? Will we be obedient to what He commands? When people don't want to worship, you because they, they, they fear that they will lose something if they sacrificially worship. That people don't want to lose their Sunday morning sleeping in. Well, bless your miserable soul. Amen. And don't you think other people get tired too? But how many times have we come into God's house because we honor Him in our worship and we find that we're rejuvenated and regenerated and we're renewed? You know, because we sacrificially gave to God. How many times has God nudged on your heart when maybe you didn't have a great amount of resources in your wallet, but God nudged at you to sacrificially give and, and, and bless. And you know what? Because of the sacrifice, you know there's an expectation God is going to take care of me. And so when there's no sacrifice, it's mostly because people fear that they'll lose something in worship. There's no expectation. You see... They, they worry more about being blessed than they worry about being a blessing to God. Worship is about being a blessing to God. Do you want to bless God? Bless, uh, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. God wants worship that blesses Him. Amen. It's not about us always being blessed. And you know what real sacrificial worship does? It keeps the cross of Calvary right in the center of things. Don't you want the cross right in the center of your life? 
And yet everything about our life needs to be centered around the cross of Jesus Christ. There is redemption, and there is hope, and there is healing, and there is peace, and there is salvation, and there is deliverance. There. Uh, anything that we can imagine is in the cross. And when we sacrificially worship, we are keeping the cross at the center of all that we do. And so because of that, it gives us ample opportunity to reflect and remind ourselves that Christ will minister. And it gives us ample opportunity to keep Christ at the center of all things. Take up your cross daily and follow after me. It is sacrificial worship tonight. And so I love when uh, worship, it goes beyond just our assembly. I'll be honest, some folks, it's hard for them to sacrificially worship and get into church. For some of us, we love the assembly together. I love the assembly together. And so it's good. But worship must go beyond the assembly. It was easy to worship Sunday night, wasn't it? The Holy Ghost was working and moving. And wow, how powerful when we're assembled together and we're worshiping. But sometimes it's a little bit difficult when we're out there and we're alone. Brother Craig, when you're on your job and maybe you're feeling tired and weary. Brother Doug, when you got to be on your toes. And Sister Tina, you got to count all the money. And Brother Justin and Sister Susan, you're keeping the whole valley happy at Walmart. Sometimes it's hard. It is. It's hard. And so uh, we have to realize that worship goes beyond our assembly, but it goes to our individual places where we are and into our homes and into our families and into our bad news and into our long and tiring days. Uh, it has to be sacrificial. Amen. That we worship God. So worship in Him. Amen. Uh, with all of our hearts. Let's jump down to the, the next line there right below Deuteronomy 8, 1 and 2. Amen. Let's read. God's plan and purpose is to make us a holy people and to bless us in all that we do. But He wants us to obey Him in everything, in everything to obtain those blessings. God wants us to obey Him in everything. So there are specifics of God's Word that we look at and uh, that God says He wants us to do. He wants us to love Him with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, and all of our strength. He wants us to serve Him and have nothing else in between us and Him. He wants us to love our neighbor as ourselves. Sometimes, and I don't preach on this often, you know me, I'm, you know, I do not count people for offering, so I'm not saying it's the count of people for an offering. Um, I don't think I'm offering too much. Sometimes I don't even think I'm offering. So if you, you don't know me by now. That's not my focus. I just I'm not focused on that. So my my what I want to say is this. Sometimes folks say to me, "Let us know." I just don't understand why the church wants me to pay attention to my next. I just, I just don't understand that. But number one, it's not the church. No one requires, I don't I don't know what any of you get. I don't. I don't ever ask the team for that. I sign your statement before she ever lets you your not in there every year. So I don't know what any of you get. And guess what? I don't care. Not that, not that I'm not concerned for you, but I'm not ever going to be that pastor that they say, oh, you, you know, I don't know. It's not a church rule. Thank you, brother. It's a biblical command that we're to give to God. And you know, I remember there's been times in my life where it was tight. Tight. There's some times it's tight now. Guess what? It's never a problem to give what God has required. It just isn't. Because you know what? When we bless God in our giving of what He commands, He always takes care of us. It's just, it's uncomprehendable. And so I say this not, not for anything about miracle or about truth, but I say this for you in your relationship with God. If you want to struggle with giving to God, try it. Budget it out. Try it. Because I think you're going to be amazed. I think you're going to be amazed. 
And I think everyone in here that gives, you know, we're, you, we just are. And, and so that is just one thing that I look at when I say that when we obey Him, when we are sick, what is the first thing that we do? You know, um, uh, you know, I, I know my background. I know there's some, some rooms where we've got to be cautious and we can get help. You know, I believe in taking care of our temple and making it as beneficial for the kingdom of God for as long as we can. I believe that. But do we trust God first thing? Do we claim the stripes that was placed upon his back? And do we ask him for healing? Because I think if we do that, I do think if we do that, we can trust God and he'll bless us. Amen. I'm not saying anything against doctors and nurses. It's my livelihood. But I think that we have to trust God. I believe that we need to trust Him with, with the details of our life that He is the great physician. And you know, when, when it comes to uh, our life and knowing uh, our jobs, I think that we need to search the Word of God. I believe when it comes to uh, the things that we ask ourselves in our life, you know, we, we put on our clothing. Um, you know, does this honor God by, by what I'm wearing? I mean, is it modest? Is it appropriate? Um, is it, is it, I, I think, I think even in our, our the, the, uh, the generation in which we live, you know, and there's nothing wrong if you, you, you make money and you have money and you, your, your thing is you like to wear some big name brand something, but if that's what defines you, and not Jesus Christ. I think that we need to pray about it. We should be defined by the name of him. And we also, we want to look nice, but we also want to make sure that we're modest. How, how would Christ want us to cover our temple? Uh, how would Christ want us to look uh, as we are, 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 are before? And you know what? Can I just be really honest? You know, we, we live in a day and age where, where uh, folks say, well, well, no, that man shouldn't be a pervert in my clothing. No, men are designed with eyes that see, and that's how they're aroused, and that's all the further I'm going. So we have to be cautious. You don't want to cause a man to sin, ladies, because the Word of God says that if even he thinks that in his mind, even if he thinks it without even acting upon it, because we live in the dispensation of grace, there's more responsibility to make sure the Holy Ghost is controlling our mind. And so we've just, we've got to be cautious. And then, you know, even for us, uh, we've got to be cautious of how we cover our body, we take care of our body. Uh, you know, uh, uh, if you have a wonderful physique, that's that's great. But uh, particularly if you're a married man, that's that's your wife, not the whole neighborhood. You know, so those are the things that we have to be cautious of and, and, and trusting. And so I think that we should pray about all those things. That's a sacrifice of worship to God. The music that we listen to. And we live in a wonderful day of entertainment. We have books, we have DVDs, we have iPads, and we have cell phones, and we have all kinds of wonderful things to entertain ourselves with. But the greatest thing is, first of all, have we spent adequate time with God? Have we given to God, or is life just about from one rise of entertainment to the other? Really? I know that, that sounds kind of crazy, but it's a time robber and waster. But also the things that we put in our mind. I'm not a big, you know, I, I don't even really know a lot about sci-fi. I really don't. Um, and, and I'll be honest, I'm not a, I'm not like a, a, a person who likes being scared. I don't like that. Like, I don't need that adrenaline rush. It's just something I don't need. Um, uh, you know, but I think sometimes people watch things that maybe, uh, go beyond the realm of just the physical but enters into the spiritual and makes us very relax at spiritual things that are real. We need to be cautious. We need to be cautious. Um, because sci-fi can become so that we forget about the reality of spiritual warfare that's going on. And we need to be going to war on our knees. I'm talking about holy living, cleaning out the things that are not pleasing to God. Uh, recently, some uh, the conversation about 
uh, OMG, oh my god, um, those things, uh, even our, our, our language, the things that we speak, is it God um, or in what we say? Uh, and you know, it, it's very, nowadays, um, you know, you see the OMG everywhere, you know, on t-shirts, on little uh, trinkets that they sell at the store, but God is not honored when we take his name. And so it's once again saying the lifestyle of my life is going to be a sacrifice of worship to God. It's getting down to the nitty gritty and looking at all of it. And, and I've just shared a few things. There's Holiness describes every area of our lives. And we can talk more about later if anyone has questions. I'll be glad to even do a Bible study and we'll look at more things. I'm uh, not being so much in depth right now, but it's obedience to God and obedience to God and our sacrificial worship. There's blessings that come. We don't do it to be blessed. We do it to be a blessing to God. But in return, God says, because you bless me, my blessings are so far rich. And so, uh, sacrificial, sacrificial, that's worship of God. The 28th chapter of Deuteronomy lists 21 blessings, 21 blessings, 21 blessings for obedience. But it also lists 124 curses for disobedience. It is our choice. God does not make us obey. If we want to be blessed in our walk with Christ, you know, I, I believe this too, that, you know, being blessed doesn't mean that we maybe have tangible, great things that everybody's envious. I mean, it could. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. But God requires us to be faithful and good stewards of what He gives us. And even if it's not great, big, tangible things, to have the presence and the glory of God in our life is the greatest. And we will never regret in eternity all that we have done for His kingdom. But there will be lots of regrets for opportunities that are missed. Many, many regrets. Now I know that you can listen and different preachers will tell you that uh, there will or there won't be tears in heaven. I think Brother Graham, when he preached, made it very clear to us that there will be tears in heaven. Heaven. There will be tears for our lost loved ones. They won't last forever. God will wipe away the tears. But when God hands out rewards in heaven, when we see all the times that we fail to do for His kingdom and we don't have a reward, not for us, but to be able to throw at His feet and worship, there will be tears. There will be tears that we could have done more. When He tries all of our works, the Bible says that there will be hay and there will be wood, there will be stubble, and there will be precious uh, 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 metals. The only thing that will withstand is the precious metals. Everything else will be burned off. So when we live our life sacrificially, we are saying, God, I'm taking my life to achieve those things which are valuable and in eternity they will not decay, but they will last. And one day we'll be able to throw our crowns on the feet of Jesus. We'll be able to lavish those things that He gave us back to Him in worship. It won't be about us, it'll be about Him. So even let's get practice on the side of heaven. All right. Does God call to a higher calling? Does God call some to a higher calling? Or a holier or a holier standard of living? He calls all. He calls all. A-L-L. -L. But only some. But only some surrender to that calling. He leaves the choice up to us whether we will arise, whether we will arise to that place He has called us. Let me read the next sentence. We choose, we choose to live holy, act holy, talk holy, 
think holy, dress holy, be holy for the glory of God. Now let me stop here for a moment. Let me just share this. As brother, you know, he has gone on to be with the Lord, and I know that his reward is going to be great in eternity. But he asked the question, as God called certain people to live holy, God calls us all to, to a holy standard. But this is what I do know. That I cannot expect someone who's been saved a very limited amount of time to be where I'm at. We have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. So is there things that God has called us to do that He maybe doesn't call others to? Yeah, we, I don't know some people's background. Um, some people, because of their background, there are certain things that they will not do because they feel like God has called them out and uh, 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 they just won't participate in certain things. I think that we need to always pray about things. It needs to be God that writes it upon our heart. It can't be someone else's standard. I believe that there are times where we have to choose a higher road because it will be a blessing for the kingdom of God and help us, but it will also help others. I, I There are certain things in the, that are biblical-based things that we all need to be living by. But there are also personal things where God deals with our heart. You know what? Don't ever lay down your personal conviction. If God has said no, and God has put up the stop sign, then we have to stop. That's with whatever He has told us in our life. And you know what? When we do that, we do that as a sacrifice of emotion to God. I don't say this to be mean. I said this last week. We live in a strongly populated Amish community. We see their standards of how they live. And, uh, you know, it's neat to see. And, and uh, I've met some wonderful Amish people. I've some wonderful Amish friends. But if they're relying upon a portion of the buggy and no buttons to get them to heaven, it ain't going to happen. It isn't going to happen beyond Jesus Christ. And you can keep your house disconnected from electric, and you can keep your house disconnected from a phone wire and from a worldly uh, system, the world system. But God's not looking at a phone wire or an electric wire. God is looking at a life that is separated from this world. And it better be more than just living a standard because grandma or grandpa or mom and dad taught us this is the way. I think that's important. We need to teach our children when we need to train them. But what we need to have happen is this God to write it upon our hearts. You know, my mom and dad raised us children to live in a very strict way. And you know what? For a long time, it was Rachel. I, as a young person, I did it because it was what mom and dad said. And it's what um, uh, I, I, had, I had to do because mom and dad made us rule the house. There came a day where I fell in love with Jesus Christ from Justin, and I began to realize the things mom and dad had taught us for principles of the Word of God, and then God began to engrave them upon my heart, and they weren't just something that was passed on. It was God who done it for me, and it's a sacrifice of worship, and I give it to God, and I do it for God, because I love God, and I'm in a relationship with Him. I don't want anything to hinder me when I come to a place of prayer. I don't want anything to hinder me should I face eternity and the next breath. So I live holy because God is holy. I'm going to stop there just because I feel like it transitions there. I want to open this up for you all. I've said a lot tonight. Um, I hope that I've helped. Um, any thoughts? Additions? Things that, that spoke to you?
I don't like that, uh, but we want to nurture people. And we want them to feel that they're welcome and accountable. So, as you said, Sister Tim, we're going to say it that makes them feel bad. But hey, we're going to have Alicia. Remember the pastor who went to visit the guy who wasn't coming to church? Was that when God wasn't too friendly with him and so he walked in the living room, not too much conversation says the pastor took uh, a piece of the log out of the fire and set it there uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a pot. And uh, all of a sudden the guy was sitting there watching and he noticed it began to die down, no longer burn. He said, Okay, Pastor, I got the message. I'll be at church next Sunday. When we're not on fire, it's hard to stay warm and hot and on fire for God. So it's a sacrificial worship. Someone else. Other times they they listen to too many people. People say this and say that. Well, you know how to speak to church every Sunday. But at the same day as when you eat a meal, if you only eat one meal, how are you going to look at it a while? That's right. And and this here is like being fed by the word of God. We need that every service that we can attend. I can see, you know, if you work second or third or something like that. But those that don't, right. they should be here. Agree. Because there's so many people, they say, well, you know, why don't you just go out and have some fun, do this and do that? And she's like, there's some churches, you know, they, they believe it's the way our church can be. It, it isn't by the Bible, it's by the church, the way they believe. And, and there's something that will go by what the people say and by what the church can be. Instead of going by the word of God. Because if your art is in right, you're not going to make it. Because God don't look at on you by your nationality or whatever that He looks on your soul. He don't he don't look to see what color you are or what nationality you are. He looks on your heart. And your heart is in your life. You put it it's on God. Correct. I can say a lot on that, but you like you're spot on. Yes. That's why people need to go to church. To listen to what they talk about the pastor at church and not be going to many churches and never submitting yourself to being in one place where God wants you. And when folks don't want to be submissive to church, um, uh, they kind of jump and jumble and do their own thing, they're really missing sacrifice of worship. When they go there, they go there. Yes, there's a problem. There's a problem. So confused, they don't know what what. Correct. That is the older woman that I talked to in the long time. She, she said if churches church don't keep up heaven and hell, how are they going to know? And, and, and we always told you know about the Lord and all that. That's why you got to find a good church. Yeah. Not a good church. But I think she goes to that church. Oh, no, God. Okay, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, it's, not anyway, it's good to talk about Jesus, and it's good to be committed. And, uh, it's just that ain't to be in the Holy Ghost. Huge loss, huge loss. But, I don't mean that, that go down. You know what, brother? God's going to divide all that out. That's going to be okay. But I'm going to know that I've done my best. The main thing is that you get paid. Yep. But I'm going to do my best to make sure I'm making the right choice yeah. to make every day of this life a valid for eternity. Just one last thing. Um, the other thing, too, is as much as we're focused on us getting right with God and our sacrifice of praise, the one thing we got to keep in mind, too, is while we're making sure that we're accountable with everybody else and everything's on the up and up, we're silently raising the next generation of the church through our example. So everything we're doing, whether or not, while we're making sure that we're walking holy with God and we're making sure we're right, 
we're also silently raising the future generation of the church and they're seeing what we're doing and how we're responding to praise how we're responding to worship how we're responding to giving and tithing and everything as we're making sure that we're right with god through our living we're also silently raising the next generation of the church Without the cross, without the loss of the world, the 